You said you wanted more Elden Ring video reactions? Well, you're gonna get them. Let's watch Bati Vidya's Demigods video now. The Demigods are each and all the direct offspring of Queen Marika. There was Godwin, okay, the Demigods, Morgoth, yes. Moog, Radan, Rikard, Rani, Mikola, and Melania, Blade hey. of Mikola. She Malenia, getting busy. Blade of Mikola. Melania, <laughs> Blade of Mikola, and Melania. Blade of Mikola. Not again, all of these Demigods. Okay, so pulled out my family tree this time because I get very confused. We have Moog, Morgoth, Godwin, and Godric, who are children of Marika and Godfrey, who, who was Horolu. Uh, then Marika and Radagon, which is herself, uh, had um, asexual children, Mikella and Melania. I think there's something about like uh, some sort of something weird in there, uh, but that's that's what I believe there. I also personally think that's why they're rotten. It's like a in, in, weird incest sort of thing. Um, then Marika slash Radagon um, has kids with Ranala, Ronnie, Radon, Rikard, who they're also all pretty weird. So there's the family tree. Gods had fallen from the blade of Mikola and Melania. <laughs> Not again. All of these demigods had fallen from grace by the time the shattering occurred. But in this video, I want to mostly talk about the origins of these characters. Who these demigods were before the fall. And some of these demigods fell a long way indeed. Oh, that's Godwin. Before he became this unsightly man. There was something about this I was reading where the faces that you see, there's one in Storm Veil, Storm Wind, Storm Veil. I'm, I'm mixing my video games up. Uh, the, the first like castle you get to. Uh, that one you just saw there, they're like faces and they're actually Godwin because he was, his his body is still alive, but his soul is like dead. So you just see him like growing oddly with no soul throughout the game. Uh, I thought that was kind of an interesting take on it, or I guess that's exactly what it is. Not sure how like set in stone that is, but it was cool. Mess, Godwin the Golden was quite the heroic figure. He was born of the promising union between Lord Godfrey and Queen Marika, and he achieved great renown for his bravery in one of their wars at least, the War of the Ancient Dragons. This war began when Gransax, a great ancient dragon, rained so calamity cool down upon Laindell, marking the only time in historical record that Laindell's walls had fallen. It's not clear why Gransax first attacked. But, fortifying themselves against lightning, the Knights of the Erd Tree weathered his assault, and Gransax was defeated. However, this was only the beginning. Lots of dragons a fighting. war against the ancient dragons was to follow. During this war, the Erd Tree Sentinels had an epiphany that the only way to truly protect the Erd Tree was to become dragons themselves. And so, despoiling the corpses of their foes, the grotesque sentinels served the Erd Tree, but fought with the claws of the enemy instead. Oh, In the end, the it, ancient okay. dragons were routed once again. In a graveyard of so I feel like that was just more of like, uh, kind of showing off, like you, uh, you know, I don't know, you uh, take where the teeth of the sharks you killed or... Uh, the scalps of your enemies or things like that. Like if these, if the Erd tree, if the sentinels killed dragons, wouldn't it make sense that they just might adorn dragon pieces of dragon as their armor set? Swords by the Stormcaller church, the end of the war is commemorated. Here we learn that during battle, Godwin the Golden defeated Fortisax, called the mightiest dragon of them all. However, he did not kill Fortisax. Instead, he befriended him, hmm. and it was in this act that the powers of the ancient dragons truly became a part of Laindell. After all, only those loved by dragons can survive the ordeal of cladding their bodies in lightning. So, from an unlikely friendship, an ancient dragon cult was born in the capital city, and the knights of Laindell learned to worship the dragons and wield their lightning. Oh, wow. Lanciax, sister of Fortisax, even took human form to better commune with the knights. It was officially decided that the worship of the ancient dragons did not conflict with belief in the Erd Tree, and it was all thanks to Godwin, commander of the dragon's golden lightning. It's really and interesting. And a true child of the golden lineage. But now, let's talk about Morgoth and Moog, Look at this dude. the Omen twins, who were also born of Godfrey and Marika's golden lineage. 
First, what is an omen? Well, to put it simply, an omen is an accursed... Real quick, I'm about to perpetually get Godwin and Godric mixed up. Godwin's dead. Godric. Oh, okay, okay. Is Godwick actually the child of Godwin? I don't know if that's actually a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I think it is. I'm looking at this family tree, and he mentioned eight people, and this family tree has nine children of America. I think, I think, uh, my what I'm looking at is kind of wrong over here. The child seen as impure, as they are born with horns on the body and face. When this happens, the correct thing to do, culturally at least, is to cut off the horns of the omen, an act which usually causes them to perish pretty messed up oh, the omen. but some omen do survive this process and some omen are even given a cleaver imagine giving birth to a child with horns in its head as a tool as a mother war. although these weapons are bestowed with a readiness to take them away we find one such omen in an Erd tree camp upon the Altus oh, plateau wow. before you fight it you might have noticed another omen nearby writhing not. in its sleep it's said that omens see evil spirits in their nightmares, and I think this omen is dreaming, haunted by the vengeful spirits of its accursed I king. definitely just went in it slashing and did not the notice omen that. Killers, oh, yeah. Horrifying butchers of twisted conscience. They wear these horned masks that make a mockery of the omen's nightmares, oh. and these butchers hunt the omen and amputate their horns. The first omen killer was named Rollo. A famous perfumer. He made a weapon out of the horns. That was cool. A physic to rid himself of emotion, so that he could this guy. perform his tasks. Remember, it seems many omen have their horns excised when they're very young. Ew. That's definitely disturbing enough to warrant an emotion-killing physic, in my book. However, if the omen is born of royalty, then their horns are not cut off. But oh, the omen special. is kept underground, How about that? unbeknownst to anyone, and imprisoned for eternity. By way of example, you would have seen all kinds of omen confined to the sewers beneath Lane Dell. Oh, right, but yeah. why are omen considered to be accursed in the first place? Some of them are clearly intelligent, so what's inherently wrong with being born with horns and great strength? Well, you're pretty ugly. Well, it's important to remember, I think, that this curse might only really exist in the context of the Golden Order. After all, those afflicted with omen okay. horns are not able to return to the Erd Tree for rebirth and are no said to be born outside of its grace. But why does the Golden Order disavow the omen, then? Well, it's hard to say for sure, but my working theory is that it's to do with the Crucible. According to this ancient incantation, horns were once an aspect of the Erd Tree's primordial crucible where all life was once blended together. Okay. And with the exception of a couple of crucible knights in and around Landell, they all have horns. we know that the Golden Order has started to distance itself from most things that touch upon the crucible. Okay, all right. So I, I think I'm tracking this. So what you have is, um, you know, omens are born with horns. Um, also, horns are part of the crucible... Um, and then you have the golden order that's there and the Erd tree that basically they don't like it. it. It is separated. It's not what they want. So uh, basically it's just shunned, even though there's nothing really wrong with them other than being like maybe hideously ugly. Um, but yeah, if they're like really strong and intelligent and normal, they just have horns. Asymmetrical, unfortunately. Symmetrical horns look cool. While things like horns, knots, feathers, and scales once grew on the human body and were considered signifiers of the divine, now they are disdained as impurities as civilization has advanced. We learn this from the knot, scale, and feather talismans, all of which are guarded by omen, or dropped by omen killers, no less. Unfortunately for the Order of the Erd Tree, these once divine impurities seem to crop up in some births, whether they like it or not. Almost like it's a genetic trait, as if it touches upon the crucible at the root of the Erd Tree. And so you have to ask, is it really a curse to be born as a graceless omen? Well, as we- Holy shit. Does he- is, uh... I, I never realized that. He has what looks like a bunch of horns chopped off of him. 
I think that's just an armor set, but I always thought the dung eater just had like piles of shit on them or something like that. I didn't really understand like what I was looking at. It just looked like an oddly shaped armor with like little bulbous sections, but clearly looking at all of this, the dung eater was born an omen with horns. Wow. I did not know that. I have to ask, is it really a curse to be born as a graceless omen? Well, as with most curses in these games, I think that depends on your perspective. In any case, Moog and Morgoth were omen royalty, and thus they were born into a wretched mire far below the earth, horns and all. Here, they were kept under the strictest confinement. Each of them were bound with charmed shackles that were covered in roots or thorns and bathed in golden magic. It seems very few people were supposed to know that they even existed. Morgoth, for his part, renounced and despised his accursed omen blood, but his brother Moog embraced it. Deep underground, Moog stood before an outer god, this horn's a being called cool. the Formless He's Mother, a, horn who craves beard. Wounds, a being capable of bestowing power upon accursed blood. In this moment, Moog's accursed blood erupted with fire, and he became besotted with the defilement that he was born into. Here, deep below the earth, he would go on to build a dynasty of blood in reverence of a mother, something it seems he never truly had. Mm. As for Morgoth, he was born into the same accursed fate as his twin brother, but despite not being blessed with grace, he loved the Erd Tree all the same, I and see. even took it upon himself to crawl out of the sewers and become the Erd Tree's protector when the Erd Tree needed him most. In the end, he rightfully became the Omen King and Lord of Landell. Good for him. Even or not, he was after all- That's a, that's pretty cool, he just kind of like the, um you know, shunned to the sewers like all the rest of the omens. And then he's like, no, I love the Erd Tree. I love my mother, I guess. And kind of rises up so far as to actually become a king. It's pretty cool. All born of Godfrey and Marika's golden lineage. Of course, the marriage between Godfrey and Marika would be ended. And before long, Marika remarried with another man, a champion named Radigan who Marika calls her other half. He became second Elden Lord and the King Consort, but he also brought with him three children from a previous marriage that he had had with a Carrion Queen named Renala. These children were Rani, Rikard, and Radan, and they all became demigod stepchildren after Radigan's union, reunion with Queen Marika. Mm -hmm. Possessed of his father's flaming red hair, Radan was fond of its heroic implications and considered himself to be born of a great champion. Yet he I'd also looked he up to another man, Look at him Godfrey, go. the first Elden Lord, Queen Marika's first husband and the Lord of the Battlefield. But Radan wasn't just the son of Radigan and an aspiring Lord of the Battlefield, he was also the son of Renala, who was head of the Academy of Raya Lucaria and Queen of Caria, I've always felt like her head is way too small for her body. Am I alone with this? Like, look how big her hands are compared to her head. She looks really weird. So, as a carrion royal, inclined towards sorcery, Radan bent his will towards mastering gravitation. <laughs> they, they, these guys all got these big head masks because of her. She just is so ashamed of her own head that she forced everybody to have big head masks. Working theory. Royal, inclined towards sorcery, Radan bent his will towards mastering gravitational magics. Rock sling, gravity well, collapsing stars, these techniques were taught to him in Celia, the town of sorcery, all so he would never have to abandon his beloved but scrawny steed. That said, before long, his powers would be put towards a more cosmic purpose than simply allowing him to ride Your boy his own Leonard. Horse. Radan was taught gravitational magic by an alabaster lord, a member of a race of ancients with skin of stone who was said to have risen to life when a meteor struck long ago. And when his lessons were complete, Radan uttered these chilling words. Thank you for your tutelage. For now, I can challenge the stars. And of course, he did conquer the stars. That's right. And the very constellations would be halted by his strength. But of course, you kind of have to ask... Could you imagine the power to like... It's kind of it's kind of a cool story, right? Like, oh, I've I've mastered the stars or whatever, but um it's it's very much a a, a tale of fiction, right? Like you can't ma you can't like challenge the stars. Oh, well, let me rephrase this. 
the stars are not close by. You can't like stop the universe or I, I guess to put it in perspective of the game, imagine the power he needs to actually halt the movement of say the universe or the planet spinning or the rotation around whatever star you're rotating around to harness the stars is um, probably pretty damn incredible. The very constellations would be halted by his strength. But of course you kind of have to ask why? Why was it necessary to conquer the stars in the first place? Well, I have a couple of theories. Theory one is that it was done in self-defense. After all, according to the sword gravestone, Radan was protecting Celia. What's more, gravitational magic has destructive power, and many gravitational beasts are proof of that destructive power. A being named Astel had even come down to the lands between in the past and destroyed a place called the Eternal City. What's more, Celians are descendants of the Eternal, positioned right above the Eternal City underground, so there is an argument to be made I for Radan purely defending Celia for some reason here. But it's possible for Radan to have fought in this conflict and to have made the first move as well. So this is theory two, that Radan <laughs> conquered the stars as a preventative measure in service to the greater will. According to a set of astrologer items, I don't think I the followed night sky that. cradles fate. There's even a banished sect of I don't people see why called he did it, the so. Nox, who live deep below the earth Nox in eternal night. anticipation of the coming age of stars and their lord of night. Long ago, these people invoked the ire of the greater will. So it would make sense that those in service to the greater will might have sought to arrest the stars and put an end to this fate. What's more, Radan was just a huge fanboy of Godfrey, and <laughs> he seems to have more loyalty to the Erd Tree than to the moon. Finally, the telescope okay. item description says that the fate once writ in the night skies had been fettered by the Golden Order. So surely this is referencing Radan's actions, and it levels the blame at the Golden Order. But putting Radan's motivations aside, it's a fact that the stars were held back, mm -hmm. and that this had great consequences for many, especially for the rest of his Carrion royal family. Let me explain. The fate of the Carrion royal family is guided by the stars, as is the fate of Lady Rani. Okay, okay. That's a good one. The fate of the Carrion royal family is guided by the stars, as is the fate of Rani, who is obviously Radan's sister. Maybe maybe he's about to say that um, Radan was able to stop the stars and, and, you know, control them and do everything he did to protect Rani or to guide the fate of the royal family, which is, uh, you know, his mother is guided by the stars, as is the fate of Lady Rani, first heir in the Carrion royal line. But General Radan is the conqueror of the stars, who stood up to the swirling constellations, halting their movement in a smashing victory. And so, if General Radan were defeated, the stars would once again resume their movement as would Lady Rani's destiny. Mm -hmm. Or Princess uh, another angle to what I just said, maybe it wasn't to protect Rani, maybe it was to stop Rani. As would Lady Rani's destiny. Luna Princess Rani was the daughter of Radigan and Renala, and sister to Radan. Interestingly, if you look at her true body atop the Divine Tower, it looks like she might have also inherited the red hair of Radigan. Hmm. Cool detail. But yeah. unlike her brother, Radan, she quite clearly took after her mother, Moor, who was Renala, head of the Carrion royal family. The House of Caria has this storied history, one that seems to go way back to the astrologers. In the Carrion Manor, we find one of their treasures, the Sword of Night and Flame. It reads, Astrologers who preceded the sorcerers established themselves in mountaintops that nearly touched the sky and considered the fire giants their neighbors. Renala herself was an astrologer, always chasing the stars mm. in her youth. Then she met the full moon, and in time, the astrologer became a queen, establishing the House of Caria as royalty. 
Karia appears oh, to have those a matriarchal hierarchy with multiple princesses and Karia knights that serve as their retainers. Now, however, there is only one princess, Rani, daughter of Renala. And at the time of her birth, she would have been set to inherit quite a lot of power indeed, yeah. for the Carrion royal family was at its height, and her mother was not only queen, she was also head of the Academy of Raya Lucaria, having bewitched them with the enchanting power of the full moon. You know, that. I mean, maybe that's cool. She's going to inherit, obviously, the whole Carrion royal family, the power over the family and the um, the school, but... Um, she's also kind of inheriting a pile of shit because what we know from the lore is that um, there it's full of conflict, um, civil war. Even Ranala gets with Radagon and messes that up. Over the years, they are everything about this place is kind of a mess. Um, and Ronnie does seem to be, oh, I don't know, like that, uh, like a uh, an independent. Uh, adversarial child right like the uh she doesn't want to doesn't seem to want to do exactly what everybody does other than the magic she's kind of like on her own program in my opinion i don't know she's probably got like lots of tattoos i'm guessing by lucaria having bewitched them with the enchanting power of the full moon leading the young rani by the hand renala guided her daughter to a meeting with a moon of her own what Rani beheld was cold, dark, and veiled in occult mystery. A dark moon, a sort of twin to Renala's own full moon. You can even see both of these hanging in the sky mm. if you stargaze from the heights of the moonlight plateau. Another who guided Rani was a character called the Snowy Crone, who the young Rani encountered deep in the woods. When you look at Rani, it's actually the likeness of this snow witch oh, right. that you're seeing, as yes. the doll that now houses Rani's soul was modeled after her, probably as a sign of respect. Clearly, Rani looked up to this mysterious woman. She became Rani's secret mentor, and she even knew about the Dark Moon, teaching the young Rani to fear it as she imparted her cold sorceries. So I wonder if the snow witch was sort of maybe against... Um the Academy or the Royal family in a way, or if she was just truly a mentor that was, maybe there was no like reason that she was doing that. Maybe she was just truly a kind person, but, but I wonder was the snow, Witch were there ulterior motives to befriending Ronnie? The young Ronnie to fear it as she imparted her cold sorceries. So what do these moons represent? It's just a theory, but I think the moons kind of act as guides. Uh, the lost black moon of Noxtella, for example, was the guide of countless stars. What's more, Rani and Renala were heavily influenced by their moons. Renala's moon bewitched the academy that she became the head of, and Rani's dark moon, for its part, also imparts wisdom and leads a voyage in the Age of Stars ending. They could even be outer gods. And yet, for all of this guidance, Caria and Leonia as a whole have experienced steep decline. Radigan betrayed the House of the Moon. Radan locked the stars out of motion. The Academy town is flooded to the north. Caria has been ruined in the west, and the stars and moon have gone their separate ways. Nevertheless, Rani, last we princess of Caria, remains. Like I said. Carefully setting new plans into motion. Sibling to Rani and Radan was a man named Rikard, yeah. who was Lord of... Okay, well, I think I got Rani. That was explained pretty well. Uh, Radan, I kind of get... He doesn't seem like... He played, a, he played a part, certainly, but he doesn't have deep story. I really like Rani's story. It's pretty... There was a lot there. Rikard, I feel like I don't know a damn thing about. I, I know who he is, a uh, child of uh, Radagon and Renala. Uh, he... He, he didn't eat a snake. He Did he allow himself to be eaten by a great snake or something like that? And uh, I don't know why he did that. So this one I'm very curious to see. The Volcano Manor. There is evidence that Rikard was friendly with his siblings. Uh, he conspired with his sister Rani later on. And there's even a portrait of Radan hung in the Volcano Manor, as well as a portrait of Rikard himself before the fall. 
Item descriptions mark Rikard as stern, ambitious, heroic, and blasphemous. A part of this blasphemy was opposing the Erd Tree, which uh. actually drew many knights to his banner, for Rikard believed in taking by force, just as the gods did, and clearly many believed that he would usher Take in that a elbow new armor. The armor that set of the Gilmere Knights reveals to us what were once very loyal soldiers. The crest of red feathers are there to symbolize Rikard's pedigree as Lord Radigan's son, and the emblem upon their chest piece represents a lord who had lofty ambitions. However, as Rikard delved into the ancient secrets of Mount Gelmir, he came across the immortal Great Serpent, yep. an ancient deity that aligned with Rikard's ambitions. Okay. And so prior Rikard to the Erd Tree, probably to the Great Serpent, so that he, he might himself. devour grow and live eternally. Alas, this was too much for his knights, and Whatever. they believed that their master's heroic ambitions had degenerated into mere greed. So they searched desperately for a weapon with which they might hold their lord, and they found it too. The immortal serpent had lived for a long time, and so there was also a weapon to kill it that had been designed long ago as well, a serpent hunter, but it was too late. As the Lord lost his dignity, so too did the knights lose their master. Not that it bothered Rikard. Mm, no, we can devour God together. <laughs> oh, I said forever earlier. Next, Just together. we need to discuss <laughs> Melania oh, well. and Mikola. These two were twins as they were born. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, okay, I, I was right. Rikard doesn't have much of a story. That's why I don't know much about it. He get, let himself be eaten. He didn't like the Erd Tree. Nobody liked him. They found they somebody made a big sword to kill him. We killed him. The end. Discuss I, Millennia I'm and Mikola. Very interested in These Mikola and Millennia. Twins, as they were born. No, Rikard, please. Anyway, as you know, Radigan's marriage with Renala did not last. Afterwards, he returned to the Golden Order and became Queen Marika's consort. But what I haven't yet... Y'all know my opinion. I don't think it's that the marriage didn't last. I think that it was never intended to. I think Marika sent herself as Radagon there to trick her, and then what she needed to be done was done, and she bounced out. And I think that's the whole story. He returned to the Golden Order and became Queen Marika's consort. But what I haven't yet mentioned is that, together, they were blessed with two demigod children, the so-called twin prodigies. Now, in the last lore video, I briefly proposed that these two twins were born after the Shattering, after Radigan and Marika had merged together to become a single god. However, I've since changed my mind. I think Millennia and Mikola were clearly born before the Shattering. There's just so much proof that these two twins were a force that were influencing the world long before the Shattering took place. Uh, anyway, both of these twins were born afflicted. Specifically, in the Japanese text, it's said that their births were vulnerable. Mikola was born afflicted with eternal youth, and Millennia, for her part, was vulnerable to rot. Interestingly, Millennia's oh, shit. scar- Is that- so the eternal youth of Mikola, is that why Mikola's, like, in an egg with Moog? Um, like, literally a baby? Or, I don't know why, it, like, the egg is maybe symbolic? I don't know. For her part, was vulnerable to rot. Interestingly, Millennia's Scarlet Rot is actually an outer god. This outer god, like many others in the game, seems to have an order that is able to be imposed upon the world via an Empyrean vessel, and Millennia was that vessel. And while the Scarlet Rot is pretty terrible, uh, you can sort of argue that it's got a beauty to it. Um, according to Gowrie, the Order of Rot is resplendent. I hear it's it. It's a cycle of death. Don't know if rebirth. I agree. Kind We've of like been the to lotus flower, which is a flower that blooms anew, beautiful and fresh from mud. I actually have art of this flower hanging in my home. I always love the symbol of it. I actually have lots of art hanging now, and I'm going to talk about all of this artwork that you can buy at the end of the video. Anyway, so Millennia the Empyrean was vulnerable to and afflicted by the Scarlet Rot. There was said to be no cure to this, and while fire and consecration seemed to be somewhat effective at warding it off, Millennia would slowly lose her physical self to the Rot. 
Interestingly, old She's legends so hard, of the Scarlet Rot have persisted in the world for generations, and we learn more about the Rot God from the Blue Dancer charm. The Dancer in Blue represents a fairy who, in legend, bestowed a flowing sword upon a blind swordsman. Blade in hand, the swordsman sealed away an ancient god, a god that was Rot itself. Hmm. Specifically, this god was long ago sealed away in the stagnant water that is downstream of the Ainsel River underground. And wherever Rot appears, the kindred of Rot appear as well. These are pests and servants of the Rot. And now, in the current age, these are servants that have been forsaken by millennia. Who's the god? Is their new goddess. So, this blind swordsman with the flowing curved sword actually went I on hate to these become things. Millennia's mentor. I died a lot So, of them. technically, it's him that we have to blame for this goddamn attack. <laughs> Prosthesis wearer heirloom tells us more. A talisman engraved with a scene from a heroic tale. Though born into the accursed rot, when the young girl encountered her mentor and his flowing blade, she gained wings of unparalleled strength. Millennia's ridiculous attack is called the Waterfowl Dance, and aesthetically it makes sense that, you know, flowing Looks waters cool. would counter the effects of rot. For oh. just as still waters turn foul, stagnation turns to decay. Thus, warriors must remain ever drifting. And indeed, Millennia does resist the call of the rot. It was kinda, There's a lot of evidence that she's not really secretly a beautiful. willing vessel, but through sheer will, and sense of self, she resists the rot, and only when she is truly pressed in battle will she abandon so cool. this will and bloom into the goddess within. Millennia's first bloom was during her fight against Radan, and releasing her scarlet rot was a last ditch effort that would forever taint the land of Kaled and cripple Radan. So, whatever she was fighting for in this fight against Radan, somehow it was worth this terrible act. In general terms, at least, it's clear that Millennia was fighting for her brother. I'm not following Apart from that. the times where she relapses into being the goddess of rot, I wish I she was. is known as the Blade of Mikla. Yeah. She actually goes to great lengths to tell you this. I don't know if you heard. Uh, despite being <laughs> yeah, the toughest heard. boss in From Software history, she's actually fighting for his right to godhood, not her own. In Millennia's own words, her brother Mikla possesses the wisdom, the allure of a god. He is the most fearsome Empyrean of all. For his part, Mikola did a lot to earn his sister's dedication, not the least of which was inspiring her armor and a prosthetic of unalloyed gold. Do you think Mikola has some like specific power or something that she is just trying to like push? Like she thinks it's the proper way or he's the firstborn or whatever like that? Or do you think she just like loves her brother? And that's it. It's just like a, a love. She's like, I'm the blade of Mikola. I'm going to protect him and do everything I can as she powers through for family. That'd be kind of like a, I don't know, kind of like a beautiful story. The least of which was inspiring her armor and a prosthetic of unalloyed gold. And it's not just his sister that loved Mikola. Many people did. The bewitching branch is an item that you can use to turn enemies into temporary allies. And it reads... Indeed, he has learned very well how to compel such affection. For his father Radigan, Mikola fashioned and gifted to him a fundamentalist incantation called Triple Rings of Light. Radigan then returns the favor, gifting back an incantation called Radigan's Rings of Light. These interactions show some of Mikola's positive connections with his father and also Golden Order fundamentalism. And yet, the young Mikola abandoned fundamentalism, for it could do nothing to treat Millennia's accursed rot. This was the beginning mm. of unalloyed gold. So, what is unalloyed gold? Well, an alloy is a composition of metals, so unalloyed gold is pure gold, essentially, with no external mixtures. So pure gold stops this rot? gold apparently can ward away the meddling of outer gods. And so Mikola bent a lot of his efforts towards creating an unalloyed gold needle. Specifically, this needle was crafted for his sister right. to ward off the rot god and forestall the effects of the incurable rotting sickness. We see the bond between the siblings as well when we visit Mikola's Halig tree. We see a statue of a one-armed woman embracing oh, that's her. Child, Mikola. In this place, we see the biggest example of Mikola's benevolence, the Halig tree 
and the society that was built into the brace that supports it. This was a promised land, seen as a salvation to many who were shunned or persecuted, provided that they can actually find the path here, of oh, course. Oh, wow. So, um, Nicola is more than just a brother, maybe an actual, like, shining light to people, someone that would help others. Um, as he just mentioned, there's a whole city built into the base of the tree that is uh, a place where people feel like they can go. So uh, Mikola is maybe kind of a benevolent demigod. And like many other Empyreans, Mikola seems to have had the will within them to create a new order. And his is an order that's somewhat modeled on the ones that came before it. The biggest thing is that the Halig tree is clearly inspired by the Erd tree. Mm -hmm. But the difference is that Mikola's Halig tree is said to be accepting of all. Yeah. even those the Erd tree shuns. Mikla himself was once embedded inside of the Halig tree, and he watered it with his very own blood, since it was a mere sapling. Okay, so this goes back to what happened in the first video that I watched, um, uh, the the um, Vatavidya reaction video that I did, that was the Elden Ring lore explained video. There was a part in there where I was wondering why America has children at all. Um, cause it doesn't seem to make any sense. And then I had some hypothesis about, um, even though she is chosen to be the God or the Empyrean, um, but that she's still a human or a, a Newman, uh, in, in the lands between anyway, and maybe has those desires to have children and do things and be good. But so she ends up being this Empyrean to the greater will creating the earth tree, but then having children and one of those children, um, goes on to create the Halig tree in opposition to the Erd tree and is protected by the other sister. Um, none of that seems like something the, the greater will would want. So uh, again, America doesn't seem to be fully just controlled and is doing what she's told. She seems to have her own, it's like she's being forced to do some things, but still has her own will that she wants to, um, push into the world. Halig tree, and he watered it with his very own blood, since it was a mere sapling. Tragically, however, he was ripped out of this womb during the shattering, and his Halig tree ultimately failed to grow into an Erd tree, becoming a misshapen husk instead. But that's the story for another day. There's also a ton of cut content to do with Mikola, and he's one of the most mysterious demigods, who I'm sure we'll learn about more He's very later. mysterious, because I didn't but know anything about him before this video. one more thing that I want to mention before I go. Not much. It's kind of one theory I had during the making of this video. So, Mikola and Millennia each have their own butterflies. Millennia's is the Aeonian butterfly, which inhabit the swamp of Aeonia, mm -hmm. and are rumored to come from the wings of the rot goddess herself. And I think it's fair to say that Mikola's butterfly is the nascent butterfly, which appears as if it's just emerged from its cocoon for its entire life. Oh. This is a reference to Mikola's eternal youth and mm -hmm. his cocoon in the Halig tree. But there is, of course, a third butterfly, right? There's the smoldering butterfly. It's said to be an eternally burning butterfly that serves as kindling. Now bear with me, but it's my theory that this butterfly is a reference to Melina, who the Blade of Calling calls the kindling maiden and the one who walks alongside oh, flame. This of course. might suggest that Melina is a sibling to Melania and Mikola. Again, that's oh, yeah. just a theory, but what I really want to talk about here is that, I at like the very that least, Melina is almost certainly the daughter of Marika. We learned this a long time ago from looking at her name in the game's files, and we can further infer it from her dialogue, as she has a few lines that refer to mothers and one that says that she was born inside the Erd tree. So, her being the daughter of Marika is also just a theory, but this one is much more concrete than the butterfly. I, no, I, I'm totally with, I'm down with that theory. I think that totally makes sense. I think what he just said with the butterflies, I mean, it's not like concrete proof, but it makes a ton of sense. And, and honestly, if it's not Melina, then who's the flaming butterfly? You know, I mean, that really does make sense. Maybe it's a bit of a reach, but... Also, her name starts with the letter M. And as I look over here at the family tree, whose names start with M? Uh, Moog and Morgat, 
but those are omens. Uh, you know, clearly not fitting that. Ronnie, Radon, Rykard are not there, but Miguela, Miguela and uh, Millennia, you know, fit that. So I'm, I'm down with that theory. Fly one. Although the reason I like the butterfly theory is that it gives us a hint as to who Melina's parents might have been. Her parents would have been Radigan and Marika, which is to say Marika herself alone, I guess, mm -hmm. because Radigan is Marika. Honestly, Melina as a character has only become more mysterious since the game was released, and I'm really only scratching the surface with this theory. Well, dang, man, that was awesome. There's a lot to... There's so much to take in. There's so much more. Um, that was pretty good, though. I, I did feel, um, oh, you know, over the last year or so since uh, I've, I've played Elden Ring, and um, I've always felt very confused about the family tree. Um and I, you know, reasonably, right? Everyone's names don't make, they all start with the same letter. It's very confusing. But then also there's um, step siblings and Merica being Radagon and having children with herself and someone else under Radagon's name. You know, all that's, uh, that's a lot. So going through the demigod stuff has been really useful. So, all right, man. Well, hey, I'm really excited to do the next one, actually. I think what I'm going to do is just run through every one of these. Um, I need to know more. I need more. And I hope you join me on the next one. Thanks for coming. Bye.